and um, you know, I I, uh, I flew from Pennsylvania yesterday all the way out to California. I did that for one reason. Um, I want to I want to give you an assignment. I'm I'm a professor. I give assignments. That's what I do. So I thought it was time to give you an assignment. Uh, and I'm not worried about you making things happen because you have to do this assignment and that the assignment is you have to save the world. <laughs> so, it's okay. It's not as hard as you think. It's not as hard. And we're going to talk about that. In order to save the world, we have to save the little things that run the world. So now we're focusing in. This is easier than you think. We're going to save insects. We're going to talk about why it matters. You already know why it matters. We're going to talk about what we can do. But we have to restore insects. Um, because they are the little things that run the world, but in order to do that, we have to restore the specialized relationships that support insects. Most of them have very specialized relationships with plants, so we have to restore the plants too. It's all coming, coming together. So let me just give you a few examples. I think I even cut it down to one example of a specialized relationship, so that we're all on the same, same page. And of course, I do live in the East, so I use East examples, but um, this is Phlox de Barricada. I'm sure you've got some Phlox out here, any Phlox? Yes. Um, well, it, it spreads readily from seed, but only if it's pollinated. Um, so there it is spreading readily from seed. If you look at the entrance to the corolla there, it's extremely narrow. And I've watched native bees land on these, on these plants and try to get their mouth parts in there, and they can't do it. It's too small. So who's pollinating our flocks? Well, this is one of those specialized relationships. It turns out it's day flying sphinx bugs. So things like the, the hummingbird sphinx or the snowberry clearwing, they have very long tongues. They sink them deep into those corollas, and when they pull them out, look, they're covered with pollen. <laughs> and they fly to the next flower, and, and you get your flocks pollinated. So you can get your flocks pollinated if you have adult snowberry clearwings, and you can have adult snowberry clearwings if you have larval snowberry clearwings. They don't just pop out of the air. Uh, and you can have larval snowberry clearwings if you have coral honeysuckle. That's the native honeysuckle in the east, and that is what makes those, those beautiful moths. Um, so specialization in the natural world is, is almost always focused on food webs. So we want to focus on that. Uh, and it's the rule. It's not the exception. And again, it, it starts with, with plants. Now there are many other animals besides insects that depend on the specialized relationships uh, that insects have with, with plants. So I'm going to use uh, this, this example because we've studied it quite a bit in the east. This is the Carolina chickadee. You have chickadees out here, you've got the chestnut back and, and mountain chickadee and some other things, and they're all pretty much doing the same thing. And of course, we always think of chickadees as seed eaters because they do eat seeds, particularly in the wintertime, one of the most common birds that are, are feeders. Uh, but this is a very important point. When it comes time to make more chickadees, when it comes time to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds. So they have to switch to something the babies can eat, that something is insects, uh, and it typically is not any old insects, it's caterpillars. I really think <coughs> caterpillars, if they are in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And in fact, we have learned they're not exceptions. Most birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. <coughs> Uh, and we now actually have data to support that. This is a citizen science project that one of my grad students just finished up, um, looking at uh, pictures of birds bringing food to their nestlings and then, then identifying what that food was so we could see which insects they're favoring. This is 20 families of, of birds. <coughs> so the, these are just the names, common names of the family. Uh, and the green bars are the, the um, percentage of caterpillars fed to nestling diet. So out of 15 out of the 20 uh, families that uh, are up here favor, you know, the preponderance of what they're feeding their young is uh, caterpillars. So uh, we're not guessing that birds really prefer caterpillars. They, they do. Uh, and what that means is caterpillars are transferring more energy up food webs than any other types of insect. That's what all the data is suggesting. You know, if plants capture the energy and it doesn't move from the plant, that hasn't helped everything else. So uh, transferring that energy is a, a good thing. What I want to do, though, is ask the question, why caterpillars? There are a lot of other insects out there that, that eat plants. What is special about caterpillars? And there are a number of things that are special. One of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as a sausage with a very thin wrapper. <laughs> so the thin wrapper is an exoskeleton, which is undigestible. The bird doesn't want a lot of exoskeleton, doesn't want a lot of cuticle. It wants a thin cuticle and a lot of food in there. Uh, and because they're soft, they can stuff them down the throat of their babies without fear of injuring them. 
If you've ever watched a, a parent bird feed its young, they're, they're pretty rough. It's like a, like a plunger. <laughs> uh, caterpillars are, are relatively large prey items, too. One medium-sized caterpillar uh, is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. So some of these are smaller birds do chase aphids around, but if you want to chase 200 aphids or eat one caterpillar. They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein. They have a low percentage of chitin compared to most other insects, particularly beetles. So uh, beetles are not like sausages. They're like little tanks. <laughs> Lots of, of uh, undigestible chitin. And they also have a lot of sharp edges, too. And it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds when they are breeding. Uh, and I mention carotenoids because um, we're learning about them. First of all, we're vertebrates, birds are vertebrates, and vertebrates don't make carotenoids. Yet, they are essential components of vertebrate diets. Only plants make carotenoids. So, we gotta get our carotenoids from, from plants, and that's why my wife Cindy says I have to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene, and my tomatoes to get my lycopene, and my whatever that is to get my, my lutein. <laughs> and she makes sure I have all that stuff because they stimulate my immune system. I'm generally healthier, uh, if I have lots of carotenoids, they are antioxidants. They protect, uh, run around our, our bodies and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you'll see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality. Who doesn't need that? Improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about uh, particularly male birds, like this male prothonotary warbler. He is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of blue teens. They take the, the carotenoids and they build pigments out of them and put them in their, their feathers. And of course, the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Uh, okay, back to chickadees. Um, they're vertebrates, they're not making their own carotenoids, so they have to get them from plants, but they're not eating plants, so they have to get them from something that does eat plants. And yes, that something is, is insects. Uh, but we finished a study looking at the, um, the relative uh, amounts of carotenoids that are in various prey items that birds typically uh, take. And look, these are two types of caterpillars. They have a lot more carotenoids than other types of, of uh, insects. Orthopteroids, particularly crickets, are number two here. What's interesting is adult moths and butterflies, the adult caterpillars, have much lower levels of carotenoids because they're not eating green plants. The carotenoids are coming from green plants. Um, spiders, important components of bird food webs, but they have even less or fewer carotenoids, and here's earthworms way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the, <laughs> gets the worm. Does that matter? Well, apparently it matters to the birds because uh, this is uh, Ashley Kennedy's work. What she did was put GoPro cameras on the top of bluebird boxes, looked at, I think it was two and a half million photographs of birds bringing, well, it took a picture every second, so a lot of them had nothing in there. But she got 7,628 uh, bluebird feeding observations, what were they bringing back to the nest? Uh, and she, she could look at the abundance of what was brought back to the nest in relation to the amount of carotenoids in that prey item. And here we go, caterpillars were the most abundant uh, prey item and they had the highest level of carotenoids, followed by crickets. It followed the, the amount of carotenoids in the diet, in, in the prey item, pretty closely. So all this is saying that uh, caterpillars may not be optional parts of bird diets, they may be essential parts of bird diets. Uh, and that means if you're a chickadee or any other type of bird and you're trying to breed in a habitat, you're not gonna be successful unless there are enough caterpillars. Almost enough caterpillars isn't good enough. You gotta have enough caterpillars or the babies won't make it through. So that is the next question. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? Um, and the answer is it, it takes a lot. Many of you already know this, but um, I'm still impressed with how many caterpillars it takes to make a clutch of, of chickadees. It was these little guys that, that taught me this. Years ago, I wanted to know what chickadees were feeding their young, so I put a, a chickadee nest box in my yard, and I hung it low enough so I could set my camera up and take pictures of what they were bringing back. Uh, and that's when I learned they were bringing back caterpillars, but I also learned they're bringing them back very quickly. One caterpillar every three minutes. Now, both parents are out foraging, so, okay, that's a lot of caterpillars. I watched them for 27 minutes once, and they brought back 30 caterpillars in the 27 minutes. How did they do that? By bringing back more than one at a time. And sometimes, <laughs> and they're doing this all day long, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. So I'm working really hard. The next question, which dawned on me as I'm standing there next to my camera, is how many species of caterpillars are they bringing back to the nest? Well, I watched it for three hours, and they brought back 17 species. Now remember, 
Chickadees are foraging about 50 meters from the nest. And again, that's true for almost all the birds. They, they want to forage as close to the nest as possible because otherwise they're spending more energy uh, finding food than they are from the food they, they eat. So they're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. If you want chickadees or anything else breeding in your yard, you have to have what they need in your yard. So within 50 meters of the nest, they found 17 species of caterpillars in, in three hours. Why is that important? That is important because if I had one or two species of caterpillars in my yard, and it happened to be a bad year for those caterpillars, all populations fluctuate. Uh, and, and these days, we're getting a lot of extreme weather. You guys get too hot and too dry. We get too wet and too cold. Uh, but both of those situations depress the number of caterpillars. Uh, so it's very possible with a very few number of caterpillars in your, your yard that you won't have enough caterpillars for your chickadee to reproduce. But if you have 17 species or 34 species or 134 species, and this actually stimulated me to start counting the number of caterpillar species in my yard, I was afraid to do it because it's a big job. I am up to 936 species of just moths. I haven't hit the butterflies yet. Uh, and every time I go out, I get, I get new ones. So it's going to top 1,000 for sure. That means that there will always be some combination of all those species that regardless of the weather, they will be common enough so the chickadees get to reproduce. So this is an example of diversity creating stability in the food web. Diversity creating stability in the ecosystem. You've heard diversity is good. This is a primary reason. I have a lot of different caterpillar species because I have a lot of different plant species and very powerful plant species making a lot of caterpillars. Uh, and then I have chickadees because of that. There's a guy by the name of Richard Brewer back in 1961. He was studying Carolina chickadees. Uh, I don't know what his major question was, but one of the things he needed to know was how many caterpillars do they bring back to the nest? So he counted a whole bunch of nests, and it turned out to be between 390 and 570 caterpillars per day, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And they're in the nest for 16 days. That's 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. After they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 24 days, but they're flying all over the place, so he couldn't count those. So just to the point where they fledged, that's 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars for a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. <laughs> what if I wanted to make a red-bellied woodpecker in my yard? That's eight times heavier than a chickadee. How many caterpillars does that take? And I don't want just chickadees and red-bellied woodpeckers. Um, I want a whole diversity of birds. I want scarlet tanagers and titmouse and, and blue jays and bluebirds and tree swallows and common yellow throats and indigo bunnies and toadies and <laughs> yellow warblers and thrushes and wrens and cardinals and hummingbirds. And I don't want just one pair of them. I want breeding populations or at least in my neighborhood. How many caterpillars does that take? I don't know, it takes a lot. You might say, well, you don't need anything for your, your hummingbird because it's eating sugar water. And of course they do, they do eat sugar water. But 80 to 90% of a hummingbird's diet is insects and spiders, and then it goes to the sugar water. You don't make a bird out of sugar. <laughs> and that is true for 96% of the terrestrial birds in North America. They are rearing their young directly or indirectly on insect protein. And when I say indirectly, if they eat a spider, the spider became a spider because it had access to, to insects. Um, and this is news. This is news to a lot of people because most people think birds depend on seeds and berries. And Landscape for Birds books will tell you how to put plants in your yard that make seeds and berries. And that's good, but they also have to reproduce. So you have to have the plants in your yard that make the insects, that make the birds, that can then go get the, the seeds and, and berries. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Um, so no, no caterpillars, no baby birds. A bit of a generalization, but not much, not much. All right, how do we do that? What types of landscapes are capable of producing the abundance and diversity of, of uh, insects that we're talking about here? Well, now we have to uh, consider the specialized relationships again. And the most common type of specialized relationship that occurs all over the planet is a relationship between the insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. So we're not talking about pollinators right now, although they have a lot of specialized relationships too. I am talking about this polyphemus moth caterpillar and the oak leaf that it's eating. Remember, plants really don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they attempt to keep the insects off by loading their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me when go out for break today, go eat a leaf. <laughs> if you're going to the native plants that don't tell them you're going to eat it. You're not going to like it. 
I can guarantee you're not going to like it. It doesn't matter what you eat because every plant lineage is, is protecting it, itself. Um, and that's why it's a really successful uh, defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those plants. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. And if there's one thing you take away today, it's that 90% are host plant specialists. So you're not going to have those insects unless you have the plant lineage they have specialized on. What they do is they pick uh, one or two plant lineages that share a common cocktail of chemical defenses and develop the adaptations necessary to circumvent those defenses. The enzymes, they can, can detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that allow them to eat those plants without dying. But it takes a long period of evolutionary exposure. You know, it's nice to be in a room where I'm allowed to use the word evolution. <laughs> don't laugh. Don't laugh. Uh, these adaptations don't fall into place uh, uh, overnight. It really does take a long period of, of exposure. And I'm going to use the monarch butterfly as an example uh, because we love monarchs. You know a lot about monarchs. You certainly know at least half the story of the monarchs, but um, like Paul Harvey, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. Um, you know that they are specialists on, on milkweeds. And you probably know that milkweeds are, are protected by cardiac glycosides. So when you're at plants, don't eat a milkweed. Or at least don't eat a lot of milkweed. If you eat enough of it, those cardiac glycosides will stop your heart. That's what they do. They don't stop the monarch's heart, by the way, and they do have a heart. Uh, because they've got, monarchs have those, those enzymes that store and excrete and, and, and sequester or, or detoxify those, those cardiac glycosides. Uh, and that means they can eat milkweeds without dying. That's great. But what about the sticky latex sap that gives milkweeds its common name? When you break open a milkweed vein, all this, this white goo comes out. Uh, and if you get it on your finger, you usually wipe it off right away. Um, but if you don't wipe it off, let it, let it sit there for a minute or so, it starts to gel. And that is its defensive compound. Oh, no. Here we go. We're good. We're all good. Good. Um, so it gels, and, it, and what it does is it glues caterpillars' mouth parts shut. And then they starve to death. So um, that's, that's kind of cruel, but that's how it works. Uh, so here's the question. We know monarchs eat, eat uh, milkweed, so how do they do that? How do they, how do they uh, not glue their mouth parts shut? Well, this is something you can watch in your yard if you, have, if you have milkweeds. The caterpillar will typically go to the end of the leaf and start to eat. Uh, and if any latex sap starts coming out at all, it'll stop immediately, turn around, climb back up the leaf, maybe two-thirds of the way, and it starts to yeah. chew through the midrib. Yeah. And it chews and it chews until uh -huh. it has completely severed that midrib. And what it's doing is blocking the canals that shunt the latex sap from this end of the leaf to that end of the leaf. Uh, and after it's done that, it turns around, it goes back down. And it can eat the leaf without any, any latex sap coming out of it. Uh, so that's a really effective behavioral adaptation that most other insects haven't figured out how to do. It allows them to eat, eat milkweeds. Uh, and that behavior also flags the leaf, so you can actually hunt monarchs. You can drive down the road and, and uh, see a, a milkweed patch. Uh, and if there are any flag leaves there, you know that, that they have uh, monarchs. Okay, those are the upsides of specialization. By developing all the specialized adaptations, the monarchs get to eat a plant. Most other insects have not figured out how to eat. The downside of specialization is, now that's all they can eat. So by, by focusing on this one plant genus, we have 2,137 native plant genera in this country, and the monarchs can only eat one. So they haven't spent any evolutionary time uh, learning how to, to get around the tannins that are in oaks, or the, the cucurbitacins in cucurbits, or the nicotine in tobacco, or the cyanide in cherry. Remember, every plant is defending itself, and the monarchs can only eat one of them. And that's great, as long as we have milkweeds around. But you know, as well as anybody, that we have not shared our landscapes very well with milkweeds, uh, and because of that, monarchs are declining. As of 2013, in the uh, east of the Rockies, only 3.6% of the monarchs uh, were left compared to 1976. I have heard terrible statistics about your Western monarchs, and I hope they're wrong, but I've heard over 99% are gone. 
Um, so I'm glad we have Monarch Mamas here because we need to get those, get those milkweeds back. Um, well, anyway, we can use this knowledge of, of host plant specialists to rebuild, this is where we're making insects now, we're going to rebuild food webs that support those insects and that support all the things that eat insects. And I'm going to use the white-eyed vireo as an example uh, of how to do both. And I'm going to use this bird as an example because that's the nest that Sydney found in our yard a few years ago. Uh, now, what I have to do is take pictures of the caterpillars that the birds are bringing back to the nest. We know a lot about what caterpillars eat. So if I can identify the species, I know what plant is necessary to make the caterpillar to feed these baby vireos. Uh, well, the birds must have known that I needed to take pictures, so they built the nest really low. And I can set my camera up again. So let's do this for a few minutes. That is the blinded sphinx moth that is a specialist on black cherry. We have a lot of black cherry in our yard making blinded sphinx moths, so the babies get to eat. This little guy is the chestnut chisura, and despite its common name, it is a specialist on native viburnums. In our yard, that is viburnum dentatum, arrowwood viburnum, and I know that because I planted it. And I planted it because our yard was mowed for hay before we moved in. Uh, we know pretty much most of the plants that are there, the blue jays and a few other things that have brought some in, but um, uh, because we planted them. And now they are making chestnut chisurus, and the babies get to eat again. This guy with the white stripe here is the drab prominent, a specialist on sycamores. We did not plant sycamores, but about two years after we moved in, there was a big wind, blew in sycamore seeds from who knows where. One landed in my cold frame and germinated, and I am not fast at weeding things out. Um, and this year, I think it topped 60 feet. <laughs> but it's making drab prominence. It's also making other sycamores, and that's how that works. And the babies get to eat again. So on and on we go. This is the eight-spotted forester moth, a specialist on, on native grapes. We have lots of those. The lunate zaley, another specialist on, on black cherry. This is the spicefish swallowtail. That's the caterpillar that has a phony eye on its, on its prothorax uh, that is supposed to scare the bird into thinking it's a tree snake. It didn't work. <laughs> That's a specialist on spicebush and its close relative, sassafras. They share the same uh, compounds. <laughs> we have both of those. This is the tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on black cherry. So black cherry is emerging as a really important component of this bird's food web. Uh, but these guys are hungry. They need a lot more than that. So let's put some black walnut in the landscape. If we do that, we get the walnut sphinx, the gray edge bomaloka, the black blotch cesura, the bride, all specialists on, on black walnut in my yard. Native maples will give us plagodes inchworms, the green striped maple worm, the maple bantam dagger moth. Of course, these are examples. They make lots more than that. Native elms, this is the American elm. Give us the four-horned sphinx, the double-toothed prominent, the interrupted dagger moth, and again, many others. Remember, 90% of the insects I need to feed these baby birds won't be in my yard. They certainly won't be within 50 meters of the nest if I don't have the plants that make those insects. So if I want mustard sallow, I need witch hazel. If I want the hackberry emperor, I need hackberry. If I want Caculio asteroides, I need native asters. The Arcidura flower moth and brown hooded island need goldenrod, the hot sphinx, Pandora sphinx, abbot sphinx, all named Virginia creeper. Red bud leaf roller needs red bud, the gray furcula needs native willows, the turbulent phosphilla needs green briar, and the orange tufted oneida, the yellow vested moth, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm. The pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the street dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown view galatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laffer, and many, many more won't be there if you don't have oaks. This oaks are going to be clapping for oaks because they are the most powerful plant we can put in our yards, not just here, not just in my yard, but in 84% of the counties of, of North America. Very powerful plants. By the way, you know where I took all those pictures? Yard. Yeah. A lot of people say, your backyard, when I actually took them in my front yard. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make a point here. I hate the term backyard habitat. Because that, there's a subliminal message there that this is so ugly, we have to hide it in the backyard. You're going to break all the rules and try to support life in your backyard, but not the front yard. The front yard's going to remain dead. <laughs> that cuts our, our, our conservation options in half for no reason. Put the oak tree in your front yard. You're alive. Why do we need uh, all these powerful plants? Why do we need all the insects? 
talked about birds, they need them, yes. But if you look carefully at terrestrial food webs, it turns out insects are critical components of almost every single one of them. All spiders eat insects, or they eat other spiders that, that eat insects. And I know a lot of people don't like spiders, but look who does. It is the second most important component of bird food webs. Uh, and they're extremely valuable predators. You can't get rid of all the predators, or you have things out of whack. Here's more predators eating insect herbivores. If we got rid of the herbivores, we would lose the insect predators, and they themselves are important components of food webs. Uh, if we lost our insects, we would lose our frogs, we would lose our toads, we would lose all the amphibians, because they all eat insects. So do our lizards, so do our bats, so do our rodents, because they're really good food. Pound for pound, there's, there, some studies have shown twice as much protein in insect meat as in beef, uh, and they're loaded, they have organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are loaded with lipids, high energy compounds that, are, that uh, uh, allow these guys to grow quickly and reproduce quickly, and if you're a mouse, you want to do that because there's a lot of things that want to eat you. Same reason that larger organisms are eating insects, they're just really good food. The skunk is digging up your yard, the, the grubs in your yard, chipmunks eat a lot of insects. What is that? Possums, possums eat a lot of insects, raccoons eat a lot of insects, even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects, like our friend the red fox here. 25% of its diet, a full quarter of its diet is insects. 23% of a black bear's diet is insects. Doesn't matter how big you are, you need insects. And even if you don't eat insects, you need insects. This is a sharp shin hawk, it's a bird predator. You might think, well, I can get rid of all the, all the, uh, uh, all the insects in my neighborhood and I'll still have sharp shin hogs, but if you get rid of all the insects in your neighborhood, you get rid of all the birds at this point. So he needs insects indirectly. Same with the garter snake, it's not eating a lot of insects directly, but it's eating the frogs and toads that ate the insects. Point is, a world without uh, insects is a world without biological diversity. Uh, and E.O. Wilson told us decades ago that a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. And that makes this an important message for everybody, not just the tree huggers in this room, not just the people who have recognized we need to steward the planet, but if you live in the middle of Manhattan or a little Beijing and you hate all the life around you, you still need insects. Because you're not going to have functioning ecosystems without those insects. It was EO who said insects are the little things that run the world. And he said it in 1987 uh, when he wrote a paper that explained what would happen if insects were to disappear. We would lose most of our flowering plants. And if we lost most of our flowering plants, not only would it change the physical structure of, of the world, it would change energy flow through our ecosystems and collapse the, the food webs that support our amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds. Go on. The biosphere would rot because we'd lose our insect decomposers that recycle nutrients very quickly. Uh, and of course, humans would not survive those, those changes. An important message in 1987, totally ignored, um, and it was kind of theoretical. Nobody was worried about uh, losing insects in 1987. As a matter of fact, we were far more worried about how to kill them. And we're very good at that. We're very good at that. And now we have headlines like this. You're all, you are all familiar with this. Insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for planet Earth? EO has already told us what it means for planet Earth. Um, this was uh, 2018. It's actually good news. <coughs> Because this has been happening for a long time, but it was totally unrecognized. Nobody cared, nobody was measuring it. Now it's headlines in, in the New York Times. Uh, and I didn't think anybody would care about this, but I got a lot of emails right away. Is this true? Is it really happening? Yes, it is true. Followed by this lovely headline, the UN says, well, we're gonna lose a million species maybe in the next 20 years. Oh, and they've got it. Humans will suffer. Um, so we've made that much progress. This is, you know, just a couple months ago. Uh, and uh, <laughs> bad news yesterday, we'll talk about that. Uh, most of these million species are insects. Uh, so what are the causes of insect declines? Um, they're, they're predictable, overuse of pesticides, misuse of pesticides, um, habitat loss, whatever that means, heavy use of non-native ornamental plants that don't support the insects, they don't have the specialized relationships that support our, our insects, that then escape from our gardens and become invasive species. 86% of our invasive woody plants are escapees from our gardens. Security lights kill insects, roadside mortality, climate change, a big one. Let's not talk about climate change right now, let's talk about all of these because we have the ability to turn those around pretty quickly. 
The, the implication from these articles is we're all doomed and there's nothing we can do. That's nonsense. We can turn this around and it won't be that hard. Changing climate change at this point is going to be harder. Uh, but even if climate change persists, we can get rid of all of these and that'll be, that'll be good. So briefly, what's happening to the things that eat insects? Again, in most cases, we're not measuring that, but we do measure what's happening in birds. And this was the lovely headline we had uh, yesterday or two days ago. Uh, that, the figure I had up here three days ago was 1.5 billion fewer breeding birds. Now it's up to three, three million, billion, billion. A billion is a thousand million, by the way. 432 species of North American birds considered to be at, at risk of extinction. Uh, this, the problem with this is shifting baseline. Now everybody in this room is younger than 40, which means, <laughs> or, or younger than 45, <laughs> which means you don't remember a time when there were uh, three billion more breeding birds out there, which means you go outside and it's quiet, you think that's normal. It's all you've ever known. None of us missed the passenger pigeon, which was the most numerous bird on the planet. Four to five billion of them is the estimate. Totally gone before we were even, even born. So we don't, we don't react. It's very tough to mount a, a uh, broad public support for a program if they don't even recognize that we have a problem. But believe me, this is a problem. Our only viable option is to live in ecological harmony, to live sustainably with the, the natural world that sustains us. It is not shop right that sustains us. It's the natural world. And if we get rid of it, we're getting rid of us. So that really is our, our only viable option. We do have parks, we have preserves, and they're supposed to be sustaining the, the natural world. Obviously that's not working very well, so let's briefly talk about why. Um, they're not big enough. And they're too isolated from each other. And every year they get smaller and more isolated from each other. When you take a big habitat like this and you shrink it down to a little isolated habitat fragment, and this is, this is an exaggeration, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that is the problem with habitat fragmentation and small preserves, because small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate. Good times they go up, bad times they go down. If you're a large population up here, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals so you can increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, often in these normal fluctuations, every population, including humans, by the way, hasn't happened yet, but it will, fluctuates. Uh, and tiny populations often hit zero. They blink out of the little habitat fragment, and then they're gone. And unless they recolonize, which is tougher and tougher, as our, our fragments get more and more isolated, they're permanently gone and that becomes local extinction. Don't worry about global extinction anymore. Work about, worry about local extinction. <laughs> Ecosystems function locally. And every time you lose a species from your ecosystem, it functions more poorly. So think about the number of species in your yard, in your property. If there are fewer species today than there used to be, you have if ecosystem is not functioning as, as well. And that's because of local extinction. If they're still happy in, the, in, in Yellowstone, it's not affecting the ecosystem in your, your yard. So the problem is we've measured this all over the world. Uh, and some of these studies are, are quite long, like over 100 years in length. And they're all saying the same thing. The natural areas we've left on this planet are not big enough to sustain the nature that we need on this planet. And then, of course, we have this problem of invasive species. You know, I've discovered that people have a limited ability to absorb bad news. And I am betting you came here today with your bad news cup almost filled up, <laughs> or maybe overflowing. Uh, well, it basically be that's the last bit of bad news. I got to stuff that into your bad news cup, um, and then we'll talk about, about good news. But we can't ignore this. We have, as of geez, I don't know, almost 20 years ago, we had 3,300 species of plants that are, are invasive. Invasive means they are non-native. You cannot have an invasive native plant. You can have an aggressive one, but not an invasive one. Uh, and they are, are aggressively displacing native plant communities. Think cheatgrass. Think all the, the, the non-natives you have here doing that. That's a definition of, a, of a, uh, an invasive species. We've got 3,300 of them. Um, and and the, the uh, parks and preserves back east look like this. This is, this is White Clay Creek State Park. I drive it by it on the way to work, if I ever go to work. And that's what it looks like in March. In March, plants from, April, in, in, from Asia leaf out before plants from North America. 
So every bit of green you see there is a plant from Asia, and it's all, they're all escapees from our gardens. Um, and it's about, it's, there are some native, native trees in here, but it's about 30% of the vegetation in most of our parks and preserves are now uh, non-native invasives that are not supporting the insects that we need them to support because they don't have, they have not been here long enough for those specialized relationships to evolve. And you're saying, well, they some have been here a couple hundred years. That's true. But they take thousands of years. We don't know how many thousands of years. But all the data suggests it's many thousands, probably tens, probably hundreds of thousands for those relationships to, to evolve. Uh, and we can measure what happens when we take away the native plants and put in the non-native plants in a, a variety of contexts, including our, our yards. Um, and I've been doing this for the last, last 12 years, so we've got a lot of data. I'm just gonna share one quick study with you um, to show you how large the impact is. Um, this was a simple one we did with a, an undergraduate, went into hedgerows that were invaded by non-native plants. So this is autumn olive and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and, and calorie pear and, and porcelain berry and everything else that's in our hedgerows. And counted the caterpillars in a standardized way uh, and compared them to hedgerows that were not invaded. The real trick was finding hedgerows that were not invaded. Um, we, we got four of them finally. What we found was a 68% reduction in the number of species of caterpillars in those invaded hedgerows, a 91% reduction in the abundance of those caterpillars, and a 96% reduction in the biomass, the amount of food that would be available there for insect eaters, particularly those birds, 96% reduction. If you wonder what, what that means to food webs, put out your bird feeder, fill it up one day, count all the birds, even if it's the same bird that goes back and forth to, to that bird feeder. Then the next day put out 4% of the food and see how long the birds come in. And that's what's gonna happen to a food web when you take away the food. Um, so does it matter? You know, this is a common yellow throat. It's a male trying to feed his babies. If he's in a habitat that's lost 96% of the caterpillars, he has two choices. One is to forage 96% harder. And people have suggested that. Uh, but no, he can't do that. He's already doing it all. He's foraging all day long, 156 trips a day, one trip every five minutes. So the other option is to have 96% less bird biomass in an area where you've taken away that much food. Uh, and, and that's what seems to be happening. What if I said to you, introduced plants have reduced your bank account by 96%? Then we get the attention even of the guy who lives in Manhattan or Beijing uh, because they, we get it. We need money. Well, insects are the currency in our ecological bank account. And that's a message that, that has to be internalized in every culture around the world. It is not an option to have ecosystems without insects. Um, I want you to imagine you are, you are this bird. It's hard to get people to, to react to what they consider to be long-term risks. And you know, if, if the lack of insects isn't killing you in the next five minutes, you're not gonna worry about it. Hey, we'll, we'll do that tomorrow. So, but we're pretty good at, at thinking about what happens to animals. So, we're gonna look at this from the perspective of, of this bird. What is that bird, by the way? Magnolia warbler. Magnolia warbler, right. So you are now a magnolia warbler, and you are uh, just finishing uh, your, your, you spent the winter in the Talameca Mountains of Costa Rica. Uh, and now it is time for you to do the most dangerous thing you're ever gonna do, and that is migrate. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, for obvious reasons. You know, they're looking at the stomach contents of, of tiger sharks in the Gulf during migration. They're filled with migrating birds <laughs> that have crashed into the Gulf and they, they couldn't make it. Um, if they do make it, they, um, they've lost 35% of their body weight. And when they hit the shore, they've got to put that back on by eating insects. Um, so it's physiologically really, really taxing. A very tough thing to do. So you might wonder, why did migration evolve if it's so hard? And the answer is, uh, it evolved because the benefits were greater than the costs. The costs are huge, but the benefits are even greater. Otherwise, it never, never would have taken hold. Uh, what are the benefits of, of migration? Well, there's more, more food in, in North America. More food for breeding birds. You get a flush of, of uh, new leaves every spring, and following that flush uh, are the flush of insects that eat those, those new leaves. So we have this, this giant flush of food, and that does not happen in the tropics. In the tropics, most things are much more steady, uh, a lot more competition down there, and it, it is a tough place to make a living. 
Uh, so when birds realized, hey, there's a lot of food not being eaten up there in North America, we're going to go up there. And if we do that, instead of laying two to four or making two to four offspring each year, we can make three to six. You say, well, that's not a huge difference, but it's enough to balance the risks and costs of, of migration. And so migration evolved in uh, dozens of lineages. I want to emphasize here that migration was only adapted because there were so many insects in North America. If you take those insects away, it's not adaptive anymore. How many insects do, do birds need? This study came out last year. Um, the estimate is 500 million tons of insects each year globally eaten by birds. And, and this was offered as an example of how important birds are at controlling pests. Because you know all insects are pests. They're all bad, we have to get rid of them. We really should be talking about the fact that birds require 500 million tons of insects in order to be, be birds. It's a lot of insects. You take them away, you're going to lose your, your birds. And we're not talking about just a few obscure birds that are migrating. There's 386 species of neotropical neo migrants in the US uh, that may not have enough insects to justify their migration. And it is our swallows and our swifts and our orioles and our hummingbirds and our vireos, our tanagers, our buntings, our flycatchers, our thrushes, our warblers, uh, our night jars, our bobolinks, all kinds of birds are migrating. And when they come back, they've got to have enough insects. So if you're wondering why we've got so many declining birds uh, in our populations, in the bird populations, starving them has got to be one of them. And it's something that's not being talked about. So it wasn't even mentioned in those, those uh, articles that came out the other day. Um, so we have to turn it around, and we have to turn it around by planting the most powerful plants. What are the most powerful plants? Uh, we developed this tool on the National Wildlife Federation website uh, a couple years ago. Uh, that's uh, not bad. It's not bad. You put in your, your uh, called Native Plant Finder, you put in your zip code, and the ranked list of uh, woody and herbaceous plants will pop up that are best at supporting food webs in your county. And we thought that was a great idea. But California was out big problem because you've got giant counties with several biomes in single counties and the tool wasn't working very well. So fortunately you invented Calscape and we're having a talk on Calscape. Yes. Yes. That will show you how to use it. Um, and let me tell you, Calscape is much better than the native plant finder. Um, so I, I, you know, I. We knew that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I hope we can improve the native plant finder for the rest of the states, but you guys did a superior job on Calscape. So if you don't know how to use it, again, I guess you put in your zip code, right? Yes, yes. Um, and, and up comes the most valuable plants with a list of things that eat them and where they found and all kinds of very, very neat things. The excuse of not knowing what to plant where you live is gone. <laughs> it's gone. We now know exactly what to plant where, where we live. But there's one thing that we, know, we, we uh, noticed, one very powerful uh, pattern that we noticed when we developed the, the data for, for all the counties in the country. And that is, it really, the same powerful plants kept popping up at the top of the list. And it turns out that just 5% of our native plants, our native plants, are making about 75% of the food that runs these food webs everywhere. So these 5% change a little bit as you move around the country, but it's always making about 75%, whether you're in the north or the south or the east or the west. Um, very, very uh, uh, um, consistent pattern. So I started calling those plants keystone plants. You know, borrowing the term from the, the Roman arch, the, the stone in the middle of the Roman arch is the keystone. If you pull it out, the keystone, the arch falls down. Well, if you take these plants out of the food webs, they collapse because there's not nearly enough food to keep them, them going. Uh, so the important nuance here is that uh, some native plants are much better than other native plants. It's not as simple as saying, I have a native plant, therefore it's as good as all the other native plants. The question no longer is, are natives better than non-natives? In general, absolutely, there's, there's, there's no doubt. But the question really is, do I want an ecologically productive plant in my yard uh, or my ecosystem, my corporate landscape, or do I want to fill it with unproductive plants? I can make a totally native landscape that's totally unproductive if I choose the unproductive native plants. I get emails all the time, people reminding me that ginkgos grew in North America seven million years ago. <laughs> therefore, they're native, therefore we can use them. I don't care if they grew in the moon seven million years ago. The metric we're looking at is how many caterpillars are they making, and it's zero. So, you know, 
Native, non-native, zero is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to create living landscapes here. Uh, so in, in uh, actually this is just Southern California, 270 species of cat catapults on oaks compared to zero on, on, um, on ginkgo. You know, these numbers keep changing all the time because we keep getting more data and it's more refined. Uh, so bear with me. A lot of caterpillars on oaks versus none on, on ginkgo. Number two uh, genus in most counties of the country are our native primus, so things like black cherry and pin cherry and American plum, Chickasaw plum, 246 species uh, in, in California compared to your everybody loves eucalyptus in California. They're actually <laughs> I get emails. <laughs> well, five species have been found, uh, of caterpillars have been found on, on eucalyptus. You know, we're doing a study, just a quick aside here, on, on uh, shade coffee in Peru, where this is what shade coffee, that is shade coffee right there. Uh, and they use eucalyptus to provide the shade. It's supposed to be helping the birds. We say, well, not making a lot of caterpillars. We went down, we, we collected off of, of eucalyptus. There were some caterpillars there. And I said, not, not like the natives, but I couldn't figure out why. Well, I looked at um, the close relatives of eucalyptus in, in Peru. There are over 400 species of very close relatives to eucalyptus, and that's why there's some caterpillars down there. That's, I'm just explaining it, you know, it's not that they, they really can jump around. Um, anyway, five's not very many. Zelkova, we use Zelkova as a street tree all the time. I think you do too. Another plant from Asia, zero caterpillars on Zelkova, and that's what they always look like. If you're looking for a plant that interacts with nothing, Zelkova is for you. <laughs> <laughs> but why don't you get a silk Zelkova or a plastic one? And, it, it'll be and then you don't have to water it. <laughs> your, your landscape will be just as dead. So. Pierre's Japonica used to be the most common uh, uh, foundation plant in the country. This illustrates that important point I was trying to make. Uh, we have native Pierre's. But it's a small genus, and it's not very productive. Only two species uh, recorded on, on native Pierce. I don't think anything's on uh, Pierce japonica. Um, one of your powerhouses, though, Ceanothus, 93 species on, on your Ceanothus that you could be using um, in attractive ways. English ivy supports nothing. Crepe myrtle supports nothing. So you get the message. The plants you choose for your yard, think of them as bird feeders. Because if you choose the right plants, they, they will be bird feeders. Uh, so there you go, they're bird feeders. <laughs> now you get to decide how well you're going to feed the birds. You can feed them a lot, or you can feed them just a little bit. This is what the landscapes around me look like. They're, they're giant uh, blank uh, lawns with very few plants in them. Um, you, can, you can put food in your bird feeders. Put the plants that make a lot of caterpillars in your yard, or you can keep them empty. There's the ginkgo back there. It's a big tree, but it's not making any, any food. And when we landscape without thinking about this keystone plant uh, concept, we're not fooling the birds. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit of data from my PhD student, Desiree Narango, who, uh, she's, she's graduated, she's not my student anymore. But she looked at, at chickadee reproduction in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway, um, looking at how successful they were in relation to the plants and the landscape in which they were trying to breed. So here's one of the territories of one of the families she looked at. Um, the star is where the nest was. So again, 95% of the foraging that they, they made, foraging trips to feed their young, happened within that red line, about 50 meters from the nest. And they happen on these, these blue plants here. What are those plants? They're all the native plants in this neighborhood. Basswood, sweet gum, American elm, black cherry, and two species of, of oaks. But let's also look at the plants the birds did not forage on. Uh, and they're all the Asian plants. So Japanese maples and silk tree, our friendly ginkgo, black poplar, Great myrtles, foster mango. And it's very easy to picture a landscape in which they are the dominant plants. Uh, and that allowed uh, uh, Desiree to actually compare landscapes dominated by non-natives with landscapes dominated by natives. Uh, and she found when they were dominated by non-natives, the, uh, there were 75% fewer caterpillars for the chickpeas. So right away, there was 75% less, less food. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickpeas. Now remember, there's a nest box in, in every one of these landscapes. So, Lack of cavity was not the issue. But the birds came, they looked around, and they said, there's not enough food here, we're not even gonna try. If they did try, and it probably was the difference between second year birds and first year breeding birds, the first year birds were too stupid. <laughs> Those nests contain 1.5 uh, eggs 
fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive. They made 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do it. And the fledglings that left were, were uh, lighter than the uh, ones from, from more native landscapes. And you might say, well, again, those are not huge differences, but when you put that into a population growth model, this is what you get. As a percentage of the non-native plants in the landscape, um, from zero to, to 100%, this dotted line is replacement rate. That is the rate at which the population has to reproduce to replace the adults that die each year. Chickadees don't live a long time. If you don't replace them, you've got a declining population. So anything above this, this uh, line here is a growing population, and anything below it is a declining population, an unsustainable population. Uh, and, and the overlap here is right around 30%. When you have 30% or fewer non-native plants in your landscape by biomass, you can have a sustainable breeding bird population. Uh, but when you have more than 30%, um, then you have uh, an unsustainable population, an ecological sink. You're, you're calling in the, the uh, chickadees so that they can not make enough to replace themselves. Uh, this, the good news about this, uh, for two reasons. First of all, it's the first time it's been measured for any bird anywhere. So anybody who's wondering whether there really is a connection between the plants you put in your landscape and the birds that want to be there, there it is. There's a direct connection through insects. Um, and the other one is it, it, it recognizes some opportunity for compromise. Uh, now, I looked it up the other day. Compromise is no longer in the dictionary. <laughs> so we're going to reintroduce it. We're going to reintroduce it. You can, you can have your crepe myrtle as long as it's less than 30% of the biomass of the plants that are in, in your, your yard. Um, she also looked at the migrating uh, birds that stopped on her, her study sites in the suburbs of D.C. You know, migrants fly right through our cities. They're not going around them, which is good. There is no around them. Um, 51 species stop. And people say, well, they stop and they're resting. Yeah, but they're, they're gassing up. They've got to put on the 35 to 50% of their body weight by eating insects, and if they come down in the land of ginkgo, there's nothing to eat. And then they can easily be the end of their, their migration. So a lot of people say, I don't have a, a, a uh, landscape which is big enough to support breeding birds, and that might be true. But if you have a landscape big enough to support one tree and you make it the right tree, you can support migrating birds, and they will use your tree. They need your support. We need to rebuild the Earth's carry capacity, its ability to support life, which comes from the plants on the Earth, so we have to put the plants back. Yeah. And what we're doing to the Amazon is not helping these days. Where are we gonna, where are we gonna put the plants back? Where, I, my latest thing here is to think about private property. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned, and 83% of the entire country is privately owned. Uh, so conservation will be successful or not successful on private property. We still need the parks and preserves because that's where biodiversity is huddling, but we've got to fill in the spaces in between them on private property. Uh, which means we have to change, we have to raise the bar about what we asked our landscapes to do. In the past, we asked them to be pretty, we're good at that, but now they have to support life, they have to sequester carbon for obvious reasons, they've got to manage our watersheds. Everybody lives in a watershed, everybody and nobody has the right to destroy it. They've got to pump the carbon into the soil. Our soils can, can sequester seven times the total amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. We just have to get it back into the soil, and it's plants that do that. And we have to support pollinators. And don't tell me it's because they pollinate a third of our crops. That's not why we need pollinators. By the way, it's only 7% of our crops. They pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. It is simply not an option. We're not talking about good land stewardship. We're talking about essential land stewardship. And that is what ought to be dominating the news every day. Uh, Roy Dennis, a land manager in, in England, recently said that um, land ownership is more than a privilege. It is a responsibility. I wish I had said that, because <laughs> that, is, that is so true. This is, the, this is the biosphere. That's planet Earth covered by a very thin film of life. The very thin, if that were an egg, the biosphere would be thinner than an eggshell. And that's where all the life that we know, all the complex life forms, possibly all the life in the universe is right there on the biosphere, and we've chopped it up into private land ownership. Tom owns this, Dick owns this, Harry owns this, Mary owns this, all right? But along with that private land ownership comes the responsibility of stewarding all the life in the universe. 
I can't think of a more awesome responsibility than that. This is the church I drove by in, in uh, Mississippi. And inside they're worshiping God's creation and on the outside they're killing them all. <laughs> We're not thinking. We're not thinking. We, you know, and that's because we think plants are just decorations. We fall into that habit. We go to the nursery. We find something that's pretty. Maybe it could be a screen or an anchor or a focal point. No thought to the ecological roles that those plants could be, must be, playing in our yards. And when we choose plants just based on their decorative value, then landscaping equals ecological destruction. Uh, and we have done that for the last hundred years. And we're now in the sixth grade extinction. That's not working so well. Uh, but if we choose plants based on aesthetics and ecological function, we can have, we can generate ecosystem services at home. We can support food webs and store carbon and, carbon and have healthy pollinator populations and healthy natural enemy populations, do all the things we need to start happening at, at home. And when we choose plants based on, on function, then landscaping equals ecological restoration. And I'm going to call this 21st century landscaping. We've done 20th century landscaping, not working. 20th century landscaping. Um, restoration is the future, folks. We've got to rebuild all the stuff we've wrecked. And there's lots of opportunities there, so, because we've wrecked, wrecked a lot. So I'm gonna leave you with, with nine things that uh, you can do to restore uh, insects to your yard and ecosystems in your yard. It's all about restoring insects. Um, and I'm gonna start with one that, that you Californians don't have to worry as much about. Uh, and that is the amount of lawn. We have an area of lawn the size of New England in the US, and we are adding, um, we're adding 500 square miles a year. We've got over 40 million miles of, of, of lawn. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a dead skate. We can't afford to keep doing that. If we cut that in half, I talk about creating a homegrown national park. It'll be 20 million acres uh, in size, just based on cutting our lawn area in, in half and then putting in those, those powerful plants. Um, avoid senseless mowing. I drive home and I pass this every day. Uh, there's houses over here, so there's a homeowner over here who thinks he's got to mow right down to the street for no reason at all. And then this guy says, I'm gonna make a meadow. Um, senseless mowing, let's try to avoid that. Remove invasive species from your property. This is a no-brainer. And this is where, you know, you, you can say, well, the world is too big, I can't worry about it. But if you only worry about the invasive species on your property, it's much more, more manageable. And don't go to the nursery and buy new ones. And yes, you can buy new ones in the nursery. They're still selling them. Uh, you want to use those keystone plants, those powerhouse plants. We've got we've to gotta up the percentage of those in our landscapes. Um, we want to, to preserve the leaf litter under our trees and, and put ground covers under there. So this is a new thing we're just starting to think about. In southeast Pennsylvania, there are 511 species of caterpillars that develop on oaks, just in my county. Uh, well, a few of them develop entirely on the tree. So this is the polyphemus cocoon. The caterpillar ate, ate the leaves, and then it spun a cocoon and hung there. Then the adult emerges, and around and around it goes. Everything happens on the tree. But 480 species, 94% of them, drop off the tree, and they pupate in the ground, or they make a cocoon out of the leaf litter in the ground, and look what we do to the ground under our trees. Everywhere, everywhere. More ecological traps. The moths come in, lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop, and they fall to the ground, and they can't tunnel in the ground. They get chopped up by mowers, uh, and there's no leaf litter for them. And of course, this, the cement landscape is, is even worse. Uh, this is typically what we do, and nobody's measured what caterpillar survivorship is in a landscape like this, but I guarantee, oh, not, not going to do it. It's not going to do it. I guarantee it's going to be higher in a landscape like this, where you've got a layered landscape, you've got, you've got native azaleas and ferns and ground covers, the caterpillar drops off, it's safe. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening, uh, your fancy gardening, because it's a safe site for those caterpillars. So consider, and that's how you shrink your lawn. Develop those, those um, beds around your trees and you have less lawn. Put motion sensors on your security lights. Security lights kill moths all night long. A hundred years of study, we still don't know why moths go, go to lights, but they do. They fly around, they use up all their energy, the bats come and eat them, they sit in the wall and then the, the morning the birds come and eat them. Uh, we have these lights on as a habit. We call it for security. If it's really for security, put a motion sensor on those lights and it will only turn on when the bad man comes which is the idea, right? You know, when it's on all the time, look at the stark shadows. The bad man can easily hide because he sees exactly where the lights are. If you've got a security light on there, all of a sudden it flashes on, he run, runs away. Um, oppose mosquito spraying. 
We don't control mosquitoes in, in uh, the adult stage. I can't tell you to build insect populations at home and then you hire Mosquito Joe who comes and kills them all. And he says, oh, this only kills adult mosquitoes. Uh-uh. He says, it's a, it's a natural, uh, it's pyrethroids, it comes from chrysanthemums, so it's okay. That is true. Cyanide comes from cherries. <laughs> it's still toxic. Um, you control mosquitoes in the larval stage. If you have a mosquito problem, get a bucket, put some water in it, put some, some um, hay or straw and let it ferment for a couple days. It's an irresistible oviposition site. The adult mosquitoes will lay their eggs in that water, then you put a mosquito dunk in there. You get it at the hardware store, that's Bacillus thuringiensis. It only kills the mosquito larvae. You've got a very targeted control, and if everybody did that, we would not need mosquito junk. Minimize insecticides. These homeowners still use more insecticide than is used in agriculture. And almost all of it, with the exception of termites, almost all of it is absolutely unnecessary. It's all about entomophobia. If you see an insect or a spider, you've got to kill it. Don't know why. Um, a lot of people say you cannot do what, what you're suggesting because uh, I've got their homeowners association rules that say I have to landscape exactly like this and I've got to use these non-native plants and blah, blah, blah. I know those rules are out there, but let's infiltrate. <laughs> Join your HOA and change the rules. Those rules were made back in the 70s when people had rusting cars in their front yards and they said, oh, we're high status, we're gonna get rid of that. All right, um, now we know a lot more. We know a lot more and those rules are still in the book. A lot of people like to follow rules. Let's change the rules and make them ecologically sensitive. Really am ending now. We're gonna end with, with E.O. Wilson because he is a, um, he's a smart guy. Uh, he writes, you know, he just turned 90 this year. He writes a book a year. The book he wrote in 2016 is called Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life. How many people read Half Earth? Oh, what? You, you win. It's usually one person or none, um, but I am in California, so that's good. Uh, you know, he's, not, he, he's the only scientist who won two Pulitzer Prizes. He's not trying to win Pulitzer Prizes anymore. He is desperately trying to save the life that he loves on this planet. So he wrote the book saying, if we don't save ecosystem function on half of planet Earth, we're doomed. And so is, so is the life. He doesn't really care about the humans, but so is the life. Uh, and, and great idea, you know. Everybody wants, well, a lot of people say, yes, let's do it. But how can we possibly do that? Half of planet Earth is in agriculture. Half of terrestrial Earth is in agriculture, and 7.7 .7 billion people with all the infrastructure is in the other half. How are we gonna have functioning ecosystems in that other half? Well, I think we can do it. We can realize EO's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation. The old approach is people here, nature someplace else. There's no someplace else. So now it's people and nature in the same place. That's gonna be, that's gonna be the future. Um, the UN talks about, about biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every place has ecological significance, even your yard. Particularly your yard because that is the future of, of conservation. So we can no longer leave conservation to the conservationists. There are not nearly enough of them. We are all now conservationists. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, although that is a good, good living. But do save it where you live. I love this approach because it empowers each one of us and it's gonna take each one of us. And it also shrinks the problem to something manageable. Again, just worry about your own property. Don't worry about the whole Earth's problems or you'll go crazy. So as property owners, each one of us has the power and we do have the responsibility to fix this. None of us are gonna fix it alone, but we can fix it together. Thank you very much.